Thank you, Joe, and it's an honor uh, to be here. You know, one of the values that I think is too rare in medicine, and it's a value without which we won't make any progress, is humility. And I sit here today, and I suspect many of us, myself included, aren't sure whether we feel like heroes or villains, or perhaps a little bit of both. How many of you have had a loved one harmed from medical mistakes? Yeah. The room's full of us. And how many of you, at least those who are clinicians, have harmed patients, have contributed to that? Right? I mean, think about this profound connection, the harmers and the harmed sitting together. I'd like to just maybe have a moment of silence for us to honor those who have been harmed, to try to heal those wounds for those of us who have harmed, and to redouble our commitment to make sure that something doesn't happen again. Now, when I think about what is so unique about this conference and, and why it's special, I'm reminded of this <clears throat> quote by Rusty Schumpter. Rusty was an astronaut in the pre-lunar Apollo missions and one of the first people to fly over the Middle East from outer space. No coincidence where Joe's from. And at the time and like now, there was conflict. And Rusty was asked, what does the Middle East look like from outer space? And his words are profound. He said, what I noticed is there's no lines in outer space. We invent them. They're figments of our imagination. And yet on Earth, we kill people over those imaginary lines. And if I think about the last decade of patient safety and quality, I see a whole lot of lines. I see us making, being more competitive than cooperative, being more independent than interdependent, <clears throat> and being far far too focused on the efforts we make than the results that we actually deliver for, for our patients. And that absolutely, absolutely needs to change. You know, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And as all of you know, it was a time when our country uh, was being torn apart. And, and have any of you seen the movie Lincoln? If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a treat. There's this powerful scene where Lincoln is sitting in an army hospital surrounded by mangled bodies and looks up and says, when will the bleeding stop? When will the bleeding stop? He went on to say his famous lines in the Gettysburg Address that you all know that said, questioning whether this country or any country so conceived or so dedicated could long endure. The Civil War was the deadliest war of all time. More deaths than all other wars combined. 620,000 people over four years. 155,000 per year. The reality is we're facing that same threat right now from our quality, our poor quality, and our unacceptably high costs of care. Now, we don't know how many people die needlessly from medical mistakes each year. We should. But here's what we do know. We know 100,000 people die from infections. 100,000 people die from decubitus ulcers. Excuse me, 70,000 from decubitus ulcers. 100,000 from diagnostic errors. 100,000 from uh, DVTs. Scores of thousands from teamwork failures, from failure to rescue, from not giving the evidence-based therapies. Now, they're all not preventable. But where we've seen focused efforts, efforts like Michael has done over at the Cleveland Clinic or Rob Welch has done in Michigan, 70% of them go away. So you add 70% of all those numbers and you have the third leading cause of death, third leading cause of death conservatively in this country. And our healthcare costs are crowding out investments in virtually every other social good. If you look at state budgets over the last decade, healthcare spending has an average gone up about 50%, higher education flat, K-12 
K-12 education flat, public safety flat. We're crowding out and destroying our future by these things. Now, we need to change our behavior. And if you think about how do you change behavior, there's really only three ways you can do this in, in all industry. And some of this is described in a book called How. You could try to coerce people. You can try to motivate them through economic incentives, or you can try to inspire. Now, we as government, or we as a country, have spent the last two decades working on the first two. Coercion through regulation, you will do this, or our whole, literally, health reform is modeled on an economic mindset that says, if I just pay you a little more, you're going to work to not harm patients. <clears throat> but let me ask you, all those docs and nurses in here who harmed patients, do we need to be motivated not to harm people? I sure as hell don't want to harm people. None of us do. It's not that I'm not motivated. It's I don't have an infrastructure. I don't have the tools. I have a healthcare system that relies on my heroism to be sustained, and it absolutely won't work. Absolutely won't work. We need, as Joe said, a social movement. So let me share with you some of the examples of how that we have a healthcare system that truly relies on heroism. In our hospital, a nurse has to go check a PCA order every time it gets changed. That's our, our policy. They, so two nurses go and double check. Probably happens in all of your hospitals. We did a little study that that change gets made about 60 times on every unit in our hospital. We work in a surgical ICU, we change pain medicines, we change the dose. When the nurse goes, grabs another patient, that nurse has to get another nurse to confirm it. It takes about eight to 10 minutes. So you add it up 60 times, 10 minutes. We waste an FTE of a nurse every day on every unit in every hospital in this, in, in this country, let alone the safety impact. Now I scratch my head and say, let me get this straight. There's an electronic signal for that order in the PCA, and if you have an EMR like we do, there's an electronic signal in the EMR. Why the hell are we spending an FTE on every unit when any other industry would just ping those two signals and say in real time, yes, you have the same orders, but they don't allow those devices to talk to each other. We have a health system believing on heroism, and folks, we're not heroes. We try hard, but we're human. You'll hear later a powerful story from Lenora Alexander about her daughter, Leah. Leah died needlessly, needlessly, uh, from respiratory arrest while narcotics continued to infuse into her, right? Joe and I got on this journey. It's a really powerful story because we were tired of these lines that divide us. So we had a meeting at Hopkins about a year and a half ago, Joe, where we invited several industries to say, could we discuss erasing these lines? And as Joe said, nothing happened serendipitously. The morning that we had this, I just happened to be sent a blog that uh, Leah's mother wrote called A Mother's Plea, pleading with us to do more monitoring. And I was texted or email from the New York Times to say, hey, do you, have a, do you have a comment on this? So I opened the meeting telling that Leah's story, and perhaps I was lucky I didn't get thrown out of the room or punched because I said to the executives of the infusion company, the monitoring companies, you guys are in part responsible for her death. Because if you allowed your two devices to talk to each other, she would be alive, and they'd have to, have to use them. And is that morally acceptable? Because the technology isn't the barrier. Leadership is the barrier, and what are you going to do about it? And Joe stood up, I'll never forget this, and said, Peter, you're absolutely right. This needs to change. We have to do things better. Let me give you another example of heroism. I said DVTs kill 100,000 people a year. At our hospital, and we transparently published this, we were giving the right prophylaxis 30% of the time. It's what happens in the country, 30%. We made a paper checklist. Paper checklist took us up to about 60%. We then built it into our physician order entry, and we're up to like 90 95%. We are now putting in a new order entry, and we were told 
oh, you're going to have to go back to that paper checklist. This decision support wasn't a priority for us. Right? Literally fell off my chair and said, okay, help me understand who's setting your priorities because you're clearly not talking to patients or doctors. Right? And, and luckily, after literally some pretty stern and forceful discussions, there was agreement to go make this. But it, there's hundreds or thousands of hospitals that have put these systems in without decision support to aid our clinicians. That has to stop. We're not going to do this alone. We absolutely need to begin to partner on these. Another tragic case of the heroism is Rory Stanton. Maybe you may have seen Rory died of unrecognized sepsis in New York at the age of 12. Maybe these 12-year-old stories hit us because I have a 12-year-old daughter and, and, and a 15-year-old son. And what was the solution? Let's make a paper checklist. So they formed this system. Now, to diagnose sepsis, there's probably 30 data elements that you're going to need to intervene. All of those data elements are in some kind of electronic database. But do we integrate them? Do decision support predict who has it? No. We're heroes. We rely on doctors and nurses who are running around doing a bazillion things to think they're actually going to be able to, 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 to do this and give the right therapies. Right? And there's been some work in this, but all of our efforts have largely been on the input of data. Then device companies to date haven't shared it, and none of it's on the output of information. Output of information that says who's at risk for things, are patients getting the right therapies, and am I monitoring performance? You know, we wonder why healthcare is the only industry in which productivity is flat. Despite making huge, huge investments in technology, every other industry, technology has gone up about 40 or 50 percent in the last de decade, and productivity has gone up in parallel. Not healthcare. Healthcare productivity is flat. Why? Because we've bought devices that don't talk to each other. We haven't partnered to create ones that, that, that meet our needs. And we're breaking the bank doing it. What is frightening is our main efforts to remedy the situation have been pay doctors less, pay hospitals less. And there's overwhelming data that that has done nothing to improve quality. Overwhelming data that we've tried a lot of experience. We got a little bit of bump in process measures, so we may use evidence-based medicine for a year or two, but then it dwindles off. Literally no evidence that it improves outcome. And our regulatory approaches haven't done much either. We legislated some checklists, but if you look at wrong site surgeries, retained foreign bodies, the curves look like they're getting worse rather than better. So we need to open up and say, we're not going to work by coercion, or we're not going to work by economic incentives. We're going to need to start being inspired. I think about what other industries today, if you look at a cockpit 30 years ago, it's more safe, not less. But it gives you less data, not more. But it's context sensitive. It's information you need, you need to make decisions. Johns Hopkins just built a brand new ICU excuse me, a brand new hospital. It is state of the art. The outside looks like artwork. We built the best ICU and ORs that we could. But frankly, the best isn't very good. Not only is it not very good, I would posit they're more dangerous than less dangerous than they were 30 years ago. Because there's more technology, none of it talks to each other, and our nurses answer a false alarm every 90 seconds. You, you wonder why productivity is, 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 is not increasing. Our nurses are going around distracting, running their butts off, and thanks to being paid less now, the nurses are saying, well, or the, we say, Nurse, you have to care for eight patients rather than five because we don't have budget. And doctor, oh, by the way, you're going to care for 20 patients rather than 10 in the ICU. We're going to be hurting productivity and worsening complications rather than, than helping if we don't get a better s solution. So what might we begin to think about doing? Well, we're going to have to take a systems approach because the way we're doing right now is cluttered. We now have computers on all of our rounds but our human factors engineers say, how many of you still use paper when you have computer system, right? I mean, I don't know any nurse who doesn't have scraps of paper in her pocket or multiple scraps like we have here in our rounds. And all of the systems engineers say, if you're still using paper, it says your technology isn't serving your needs. Now, come make rounds in my ICU. We have a whole, whole lot of paper going on because what the tools that we have haven't been designed with clinicians, with patients, to make sure things are better. But 
there is a success story. And there's a success story, perhaps the only national success story, and I'd like to share that with you briefly. It's a success story, though, that began pretty ignobly. You see, this little girl on a snowy night in February 2001 died in her mother's arms after she was taken off life support from a whole series of complications that began as a catheter infection. And her mother, Sorrel King, an amazing woman, a year after Josie died, came to the hospital and said, could you tell me that Josie's less likely to die today than she was a year ago? Like you, we're doing a lot of stuff. I started talking to her and saying, oh yeah, here's all the things we're doing. I have this going on and that going on. And as I'm talking to her, I had this almost out-of-body experience. I felt like I was playing whack-a-mole because what I realized is there was no science. There was no theory. There sure as hell was no measurement. There was a lot of motion and mumbo-jumbo, but, but I couldn't give her an answer. At the time, our rates of infections were sky high, sky high. Now, if a hospital has those rates of infection, they were 11 to 15, I would say publicly they should be shut down, no business operating. But at the time, I was one of those doctors hurting people and causing infections. I didn't want to. My mental model was, hey, these things happen when you care for sick patients. These things happen when you do big operations. Stuff happens when you care for little babies. It was my mindset, my framework wasn't that they're preventable. It was that they're inevitable. So we worked to change that. We developed a checklist. We changed the culture by getting doctors and nurses to work together. We measured and transparently reported our infection, and we investigated every infection as a defect. Infections went away. Literally, were zero in many of our ICUs. We then partnered with our great colleagues at the Michigan Hospital Association and the hospitals throughout Michigan. Rob Welch was one of the leaders there. Within three months, infections in the whole state were cut in half. Within six months, the median was zero. The mean was down by 70%. And I'm happy to report now, they've now stayed that low for seven years. As you know, most safety is like an accordion. You push, it go, it, you improve, you stop pushing, it goes seven years. Not only that, we looked at the mortality of any Medicare patient admitted to an ICU in Michigan, 10% lower than the surrounding states. We saved, as Joe said, about $100 million a year. The average hospital saved over a million a year. And joy was restored in many of our clinicians' lives. We then took that program state by state, partnering with the American Hospital Association, state hospital associations, and many others, and reduced infections by 50%. So as Joe said, there are now 1,500 hospitals that have an infection rate that was once deemed impossible. They have a rate of one across all of those. And to frame this for you, we're not talking about some little problem. These catheter infections kill more people every year or about the same in the U.S. as breast cancer or prostate cancer. So we're talking about a public health problem the size of breast cancer that with some pretty simple yet coordinated interventions, it was solved. Now, the private sector had a huge role in that. When we started, none of the central line kits had the required equipment you needed to comply, and the vendor community was cooperating. They worked with the clinicians. They put in what they need. So now the doc doesn't have to run down the hall to get the extra equipment. It's all packaged together, and that was a big reason why we needed to work. So we felt pretty good about that for about a week, until I was talking to one of our engineers, Alan uh, Ravitz, who's worked the Applied Physics Lab, and he said, you know, Peter, that's great, but that's one harm that patients suffer, and a patient in the ICU probably suffers a dozen. And suffering one harm increases the risk of that they're going to suffer more, so why the heck are you tackling them one at a time? He said, you know, Peter, we put satellites up. Do you think if we put a satellite that could blow up for a dozen reasons, and it didn't blow up for cause one, but it blew up for cause two through 12, we'd be patting ourselves on the back and say, great job, you didn't blow up because of the uh, fuel cylinder, but it blew up for those other things. Oh, but that's okay, but it really didn't blow up for this thing. Why aren't we accountable for all patient harm, to totally eliminate patient harm? So with some support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, we decided to take an ambitious goal. Through a project called Emerge, we said, could we, partner with patients, 
their families and others, hopefully many of you, to eliminate all harms in an ICU patient, then spreading it, including harm from care that is disrespectful and undignified. See, we not only harm patients physically, but we too often give them care that is disrespectful. And those harms are every bit as real as the clinical harms. To do this, we package this amazing, what we call transdisciplinary team. And just without being a geeky nerd, it's a really important concept. Interdisciplinary is different disciplines working on a common problem, but staying in your own mental model. So I'm an economist, I pull economic lever. I'm a nurse, I do nurse things, which is the way we're tackling the problem. Transdisciplinary says, we're gonna work on a common problem with these 18 different disciplines, but we're gonna develop a common theme. We're gonna erase those lines. I'm gonna draw from sociology and anthropology and ethics and technology, but it's gonna to fit together into a system, enough of this heroism. So we're fortunate to have all these disciplines, different disciplines working together. And we went to tackle seven harms. And to give you an idea of the different heroism, when we looked listed those harms that an ICU patient would suffer, every one of them has a checklist of therapies. If we were to add up what we would need to do to prevent all these harms, your average ICU patient, the same for a patient with multiple chronic disease, would need over 200 things done a day. Think about that, 200 things, because some things happen three or four times, no one's ever listed them. We've never said, okay, here's what they're gonna do. So here's just an amazing amount of things that we would say, okay, every harm has a different checklist. And how are we gonna make sure that we actually make sure that all of these things actually happen? It's certainly not gonna happen without, with, with just our memory. We're going to need the aid of technology. And that's one of the things we're delighted to be working with some engineers on, is to say, how could we make sure that these systems, that these care are all absolutely ensured that patients get all of these things together. Because the reality is, I'm not smart enough to remember 200 things. And our nurses are too busy to think that all these things are gonna happen at once. So we went through this and used a system engineering design. I'll never forget when I was talking to our engineers and Alan Ravitz said to me, what's the goal of what you wanna achieve in healthcare? Because I can't design a system unless you define a goal. I mean, and this may sound stupid to us, I've never seen a healthcare system be concrete and prioritize the goal. He said, I'm not designing this system. We have a system engineering model. What is it you want to achieve? So I don't know if we're right. We said we want to partner in pa with patients and families to do three things in order of priority. Eliminate preventable harm, optimize patient outcomes and experience, and reduce healthcare waste. Because we spend about 30% of our healthcare dollars not getting people better. So with that, he said, okay, now I could begin to design a system that does this. And it's not just technology. It's technology with culture and teamwork and people and the process. All of it has to fit together. What we've done in safety or in healthcare is the same thing that we've done in basic research is this reductionist mindset where we go in our silos for the little atoms and we haven't brought it all together. So even something like patient-centered care now isn't one field, it's about six with everyone having their own little niche of shared decision-making, engaged patients, activated patients, and we're not moving the needle when we pull all these things. So to, to get this together, we had we worked with the design company IDEO. Many of you are here. We spent a day to design a new ICU. The brainstorming was just phenomenal, and now we're building it. So what are some of the things that are beginning to look at this? Well, we are having an iPad that has patients could see and their families could see which of those 200 things did we actually do? Right? That's ruthless transparency about we're supposed to give you 200 things. You ought to know, Nancy, if I did it so you're getting well and, and hold us to it. We have menus to say how engaged do they want to be? Do they actually participate in the care? So families now are providing oral care, which used to be done by nurses. They're actually helping patients ambulate. This is radical involvement. Again, erasing those lines and partnering with families. Our nurses said, okay, I get I can't know those 200 things. No one's ever displayed it. So one of our nurses said, boy, you know, our, our brains think in a clock. Could you make a clock that says, don't worry about this is a nurse job, this is a jock lab, but those mission critical checklist items, when have they do and when have they been done? So our engineers, again, Alan Ravitz working with Adam Saperstein, another intensivist who's leading this effort, 
and said, let's make this clock so a nurse and a family could look any time of the day what's supposed to be done and when it's actually, actually due. The nurses and docs who've seen this have said, my God, why have we done this 30 years ago, right? Instead of making me guess, now we could all see we're on the same page working towards those common goals. You see, we could give Josie King an answer to that question, is she less likely to die now for one harm? But I can't give Lenora Alexander an answer. I can't give Roy Stanton's mom an answer. And they deserve one. They deserve one deeply. So the question for us is what, what are we going to do to make that happen? Right? Because we have to get rid of these lines. And what most importantly we need to recognize is the private sector is not the enemy. Nurses aren't the enemy. The government or regulators aren't the enemy. The doctors aren't the enemy. The enemy is cancer. The enter enemy is preventable death. The enemy is that kid who dies and doesn't go into college to become a scientist. The enemy is the kid in inner city Baltimore who doesn't get funding to go to college because we're spending so much money on health care. That is the enemy. And that's what we have to pull together to try to solve. Now, Joe used the word to say this is a movement. And I'm completely convinced safety is going to change because it is a social movement. I'll share with you a little bit about what we know about social movements. I'll give you an example, civil rights movement. Many of you probably know Rosa Parks started, or is one of the main founders of that, when she refused to give up her bus in Alabama when she was on there sitting proud on that bus. But what many people don't know is Rosa wasn't the first person to get arrested for not giving up her seat. Indeed, there were scores of people who got arrested ten the, the month she did for the past five years. So why did Rosa spark a social movement? Well, it turns out these movements all have some key characteristics. Rosa had a really tight group of friends who loved her and cared deeply about her. And she was a social butterfly. She was connected weekly to many, many other groups. Indeed, she was estimated to be in about 150 different social clubs. And she just happened to have a minister, Martin Luther King, who, when he heard about what happened to her, gave some simple rules, nonviolent protest. And when Rosa's close friends heard what happened, and Martin Luther King said nonviolence protest, they started a bus boycott. And that spread to all our different social groups who also started to doing it. And they were transparent about who's doing it and who's not. And when I look at why did this Clabsy thing spread in the ICU, it spread because it was a social movement. We had small groups of ICU doctors and nurses who were really cared about each other. You walk into Rob's ICU or Adam's ICU, they're a team, they care deeply. And they were connected weekly to all the other ICUs in the state, and then in this case, the states were all connected through the social movement. And we gave them some very simple rules. Use the checklist, work as a team, report your infection rates, and it was magical. Third example of a social movement, and I have to bring up my Ravens. I know all of you may not be a Ravens fan, but how many of you have ever done the wave, the, the wave at, a, at a baseball or football game? Okay. So the wave started, amazing story, with Crazy George Henderson, a, a cheerleader when the Oakland A's were playing the Yankees. The A's were down two games to none. And he said, okay, I got to get something going. So he has this great description where he says, okay, I started banging on, on the drums. And that gets attention of the people in one section. As you know, if you've ever gone to a game, you typically know the people around your section. You go there a lot. And they're weakly connected to everything else. And he gave them some simple rules. Throw your hands up in the air and progressively do it. And if people don't progress it, boo them. Right? So there's some social feedback. Right? And it spreads horizontally and crazy. Now, imagine trying to do the wave at a football stadium by coercion. You will do the wave because I'm more powerful than you. Right? Or I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger than you. Or 
even by economic incentives, like we're trying to do healthcare. Hey, here's 20 bucks. I'm going to walk around the stadium, 20 bucks. Everyone's going to go to the wave. Let's try to do it. No way are we going to change something like we need to do. This needs to be a social movement, right? It will change by inspiring people, by, by touching intrinsic motivation, not intrinsic motivation, by working on love and not power. Because we have a health reform system that has been all about power, all about hierarchy, all about extrinsic motivation, and not about love and intrinsic motivation. And that's the only way we're going to be able to get the needed change that's going to answer for these little girls and, and boy, that they're less likely to die. They deserve that answer. We, I think, could collectively give it to them. You know, Abraham Lincoln, his brilliance was that he found that balance between power and love. And his second inaugural address has those most brilliant words, with malice towards none, with charity towards all. Right? That's what we are going to need to do. No more lines. Be able to look them in the eye and say, Leah is less likely to die now because of what you did.